Well, good morning, everybody. Very nice to be here. Um, <clears throat> academics are always pleased to talk at events such as this, except, of course, on Wednesdays, because that interferes with two weekends, at the risk of uh, <laughs> encouraging our last questioner. Uh, more seriously, my excuse for talking to you today is I had a real job once, uh, and, and I think a lot of universities are getting much closer to industry. But that's not really uh, what I want to talk about this morning. Um, I'd like to say uh, a, a little bit about the changing industry structures, drawing from uh, discrete manufacturing uh, and, and then leading on to uh, how we link research to industrial needs, again reflecting the previous question. Uh, saying a little bit about emerging industries, because I worry sometimes that we spend too much time uh, at, in manufacturing just trying to make today more efficient, where we should be worrying about what we do in the future. Uh, and then a bit about where next for manufacturing. So it's a bit of revision, a uh, bit of theory, worked example uh, from the process industries, uh, and then a bit about the future. We don't need to write that down because it won't be in the exam. Uh, first of all, let me say that for, for me, manufacturing is this whole cycle of understanding markets, design, production, distribution, and service. This may be taking liberties with the English language, but what the hell. Uh, and if we start thinking about manufacturing in that way, then it gives us a completely different uh, idea about its role in the economy. And, and of course, what's happened is, as you will all uh, be aware, that the industries have fragmented over the last decade or so. Uh, and what we have, not universally, and perhaps less so in the process industries than in others, but these various steps in the value chain, often being in different commercial organizations, uh, often in different parts of the country or even different countries. Some examples, um, to be technical, uh, plastic logic squirt blobs of glue onto plastic, that's for the engineers among you. Um, what they're actually doing is developing the processes uh, which will allow us, to, allow us to have flexible screens and so on. You might think it looks like an R&D outfit. It's part of modern manufacturing in my view. Uh, how many people have got an iPhone? Hands up if you have an iPhone. That's amazing. Um, and of course they don't make anything, they just do this design, this sort of interface stuff, but it's enormously profitable. Uh, and the physical bit is done somewhere else. Uh, but I would argue that design is absolutely an integral part of the manufacturing cycle. Our friends at GKN, a classical production manufacturing company, making things like constant velocity joints. The older members of the audience may remember changing those on winter's nights under the car, very disagreeable. Uh, they don't break down anymore, uh, and they do actually. They are rather important because, as you know, they're the bits that take the drive from the engine to the steerable front wheels. No big market for cars that only go straight on, so these are very popular. Tesco's, uh, what the hell are we doing talking about Tesco's in a, uh, a manufacturing talk? Um, and I like to say, if you stand at the checkout at Tesco's, I've never done it myself, but I, I know people who have, um, uh, uh, and you look back down the supply chain, you can see uh, a modern manufacturing system. Uh, I was actually talking about this stuff to a, an audience almost as posh as you lot, and when I said the word Tesco, there was a, uh, a restrained shriek from the audience, and the lady going, oh! So I, normally now I say Tesco's or Waitrose or Fortnum and Mason's, depending on where you shop. Um, and of course Xerox, if we're talking about the service end of manufacturing, Xerox famously, uh, again, uh, those of you with grey hair will remember when you couldn't buy a copier from Xerox, you had to rent it. That was a service business model. Uh, they didn't call it that in those days, but we do now. Um, and of course, what's happening, the Japanese then very unreasonably were able to make things more cheaply than you could rent them from Xerox, so that blew that apart. Um, but more seriously, Xerox are now back in this product service system game uh, and also remanufacturing, which I think is an integral part of the way we're going to have to think about modern manufacturing, recovering the original materials, and very often not throwing things away, which are only a teeny bit worn out. So here's a bit of theory, um, so concentrate for this. Um, the, a lot of people like to think that it research is about boffins, you know, rather long hair, work at night, orange trousers, all that stuff, white coats, occasionally a bit grubby sometimes. Um, the, the important point to make is that, in, that, manufacture, that research goes on at uh, many levels. Down at the bottom here, uh, there you've got the guys with uh, long hair and beards and 
always a giveaway, um, and, and they're really pursuing the science for its own sake, and there's nothing wrong with that at all, it's very important. Uh, I say to my distinguished scientific colleagues, you know, science is easy, it's just lying around there, if you do, don't discover it, somebody else will, but engineers do something new and original, and that makes me extremely popular. Um, the serious point is it's not a dishonourable pursuit of science, it's just different. Uh, and so the next level of enabling technologies is more like an engineering activity. And at the top there, uh, you're applying that technology into uh, commercial and social activities. Research goes on at all these levels. Uh, and I think it's important that research is about new knowledge. It's not just about uh, boffins and uh, equations and test tubes. Um, you, you'll be streets ahead of me, I'm sure, because this theory is not too demanding. There's our value chain along the top. Uh, there on the left-hand side are all different kinds of research and you can instantly see that we can now try and map different kinds of research to different points along the value chain. And I think that makes it, uh, encourages us to do that matching more effectively rather than say boffin in lab talks to boffin in company and then goes back and does some more. Actually there are different kinds of research which can be mapped onto the value chain in very different ways. So innovation is the theme of this uh, meeting um, and of course if we're going to understand innovation properly we'd better understand how we create and capture value. It's all about that, it's not about having a really neat idea uh, and isn't that really a whizzy bit of chemical or a whizzy machine, it's how do we create uh, and capture value. Uh, and that's about the, the sources of innovation and the use of it being clear and, and transparent. Uh, and I'd like to spend a few minutes on this emergence thing. As I said at the outset, there's a real worry that we, uh, um, as an old-fashioned manufacturing engineer, um, I was taught to make things a bit quicker or a bit cheaper. Uh, don't change anything, but I said don't change anything because that makes it all much more difficult. In fact, what we should be doing is looking at where industries, not just technologies, but industries are emerging and saying, now, how can we get a bit ahead of the game? Because we all too often forget that part of the innovation, an integral part of the innovation, is making stuff. Uh, and I get really cross when people, there's manufacturing here and there's innovation over here. For goodness sake, actually, many kinds of innovation are only realised through effective production. So there's our dear old friend, the, uh, the Valley of Death. Uh, boffins over on the left, getting their money, uh, research grants, uh, and then very often on the blue line, uh, ways in which that knowledge might be exploited, but all too often failing because the design's rubbish, the manufacturing strategy wasn't good, we couldn't scale up production, we heard that earlier. Uh, all sorts of reasons why things don't really uh, come good in the way we might hope. And something of that is about making sure that we have the right industrial configuration, the right value chain configuration for um, different parts of that emergence. And uh, some names there you will recognise. These are process companies, these are pharmaceutical companies. But as you go through that emergence, you need different configurations of companies doing different things. You need to get the handovers right as you go along, and you've got to have the right capabilities at the right place uh, from starting out to being able to do these things at scale. So, uh, where next for manufacturing? Um, well, first of all, I, I would uh, encourage you to think that we should, we will do much better to take a broad view rather than a narrow view of production. That's not to say production is not important, uh, but it gives you very different answers uh, uh, compared with taking the whole view of the manufacturing system, if you will. I think there's more we can do to um, understand value chains, understand better where uh, value is really created and captured. I think we could manage industrial emergence better rather than just throwing money at the front end uh, to universities, although that's not a bad thing, and they're just hoping something will come out at the other end. And I think we do need new kinds of people. We talk about skills, and of course that's extremely important, but we also need what I would like to think of as industrial systems architects, people who can go all the way from understanding the science to understanding business, and more broadly than that, understanding how whole industrial systems work. Uh, because if we're going to play in that game, we better need uh, have people who know how to do it. And we used to, 
uh, in our great companies, and I wouldn't be surprised if there are a few people from ICI here, uh, we used to know how to do that in this country, and we've got to be very careful as we lose uh, some of our large companies that we don't lose that critical expertise. Uh, just a few pictures from the Manufacturing Foresight, um, which was published last year, uh, and I think did a pretty good job in setting out where we think manufacturing might be going. Some of this you'll recognise, there's that value chain, the story about services, ARM, you know, who have the designs of their chips in virtually all the mobile devices, devices uh, on the planet. Um, faster, more responsive, uh, personalisation, a really big issue in pharmaceuticals, uh, as, as many of you will know, people are going to want uh, what they want, when they want it, um, and precisely tailored. Uh, New market opportunities. I, I, actually, I've changed my view on this. I, I used to think old people really didn't matter much. I, I'm changing. Uh, <laughs> so, um, there's a bit about onshoring, um, a debate we could have about that. I'm not sure there's much onshoring going on, but I think people are making decisions to make things at home rather than elsewhere, and that is a, a big change. Strong demand for manufacturing workers, uh, and the way Foresight put the... Uh, the thing about what I would call industrial systems architects, I think they're hinting at the same thing uh, with these hybrid skills, uh, that we need a bit more clarity on what that is and how we create it. And then sustainability. I, I'm a late convert to this sustainability malarkey. Um, I used to think, you know, the kids come home, another ten ways to save the African elephant. Does it really matter? Oh, I don't know. Why don't they teach them to make something? Um, the fact is uh, that I think the costs, of, quite apart from the environmental damage, which clearly is important, uh, the costs of making things, the way we do things, the energy we use, all are changing dramatically. Uh, and um, even old-fashioned production engineers, if given a different challenge to optimise, uh, can do a lot towards this. So let's just sum up, and this thing f flashing here, it's really quite scary, it looks rather nuclear, isn't it? process industry, isn't it? Um, where's the UK? Um, we're actually still in a world-leading position in quite a lot of industries. We worry that we've lost some of the great names, and that was uh, very clumsy and foolish. Um, nevertheless, we have strong positions in key industries, long order books. In aerospace, for example, we're at full stretch, uh, uh, and we can't make enough stuff. Um, but I don't need to tell you that we've got new competitors rising fast who have the great advantage, starting with a... Uh, a green field rather than a brown field, and can install the best stuff. Those of you who go will chi to China and so on will know that that's exactly what they're doing. What have we got? What's the good news? The good news is that over the last five years, new approaches and new mechanisms, industrial strategies you've heard about already, uh, the aerospace industry was able to conjure £1.07 billion out of the government for R&D over the next seven years, uh, that's enough to get up in the morning for. Um, and it's had a catalytic effect on other industries, maybe also the, um, uh, the chemistry industry, saying, gosh, if the government's going to take it seriously, perhaps we'd better get our act together, and I know that's, that's happening. The eight great technologies, or is it nine or ten, doesn't really matter. There's been a serious look at what the emerging technologies are. Uh, I distinguish, again, between technologies and industries. Very important to get the technologies right, but let's not forget they'll be manifest through industries. Centres for Innovative Manufacturing. In the um, uh, universities, there are now 14 centres for innovative manufacturing. Again, to the point the gentleman made just before this session, uh, these are centres which are very close to industry, responding to industry needs. And, of course, the High manu Value Manufacturing Catapult, of which CPI is such an important member. Local and national priorities we need to get a handle on, though, and how they fix an international context. Not much point talking about manufacturing on this little island alone. Uh, and as the previous speaker said, uh, alignment across government. We need to get this manufacturing landscape clear. Uh, some of you were involved with some work that was done a couple of years ago to try and uh, develop the uh, manufacturing landscape, and that's been published and used, uh, and allows you to spot where there might be interesting opportunities. And that process is being uh, rerun now and refreshed. And uh, again, anybody who would like to get involved with that, please let me know. 
Uh, and that led us to some strategic themes which have enabled policy to focus and serious investment decisions to be made. So uh, I think it's clear, distinct from five years ago, um, as you go around the world, and I do that quite a lot, my colleagues say things go better when I'm not there, um, everybody is talking about manufacturing um, because they don't quite know how it works anymore and don't know whether it matters or it doesn't. Industries in strong position with global opportunities. We used to sail around the world, stealing people's countries. Very rude. We don't do it anymore. Uh, but uh, surprisingly, we have good relationships around the, the world, uh, and we need to exploit them more effectively. The infrastructure is there. I'm not sure we use it enough. Lots of good stuff going on that we've heard about in training, uh, in research, in translation, and, and spreading good practices, not just about R&D, as we've heard before. It's about getting good practices. If we could raise everybody's performance to that of the best, we could make a dramatic difference without another test tube or another equation. Uh, but finally, uh, and I think this is the crucial bit, we've got lots of bits of the cake now, lots of ingredients um, that are better than they've been for decades. The trick now is to bake them into something effective, get the alignment right, get the implementation right, uh, and develop the manufacturing ecosystem. For me, an ecosystem is a bit like a muddy pond that some people, not me, have been known to sort of slip into on a muddy uh, winter's night on the way back from the pub. It's got newts and reeds and water boatmen and stuff. The point is, we don't quite understand how all these things work together, but there is an ecosystem. And that's what we've got today. Things don't happen in one great shed or happen neatly in a very linear value chain. There are lots of actors, and we have to be clever about understanding how to pull the right actors together to create value and then capture it and make sure some of it stays in the UK. Thank you very much.